The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar, Initiatives for Cleaner Air. This webinar is being presented by David Casaza, an associate at Remy. David has been working at Remy for two and a half years now, and in this time, he has provided support to our clients and worked on consulting projects. I'm Brian Real, Marketing and Event Coordinator at Remy, and I'll be hosting this webinar. Remy provides economic modeling software that informs policies impacting day-to-day -day lives in the fields of tax, economic development, equity, transportation, and in the case of this webinar, energy and environment. If you have any questions about Remy, I encourage you to reach out to info at remy.com and we'll assist you in any way we can. At any time during this presentation, you can ask a question in the question box. And time permitting, I will moderate these questions to David after he has finished presenting. If we don't get to your question, we'll make sure to reach out to you directly. Shortly after the conclusion of this webinar, a link will be sent to your email that contains the slides and a recording of this webinar. If you have any questions on these materials, you can send an email to info at and we'll get back to you promptly. Thank you again, everybody, for joining, and take it away, David. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, Brian mentioned welcome, everybody, to uh, our webinar on uh, initiatives for cleaner air. Um, this will be focusing uh, basically on uh, in three parts, uh, which I'll go into now. Uh, first, uh, basically just an overview of the uh, of the IRN, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and we'll be going into the uh, actual components that the EPA uh, will be enjoying. Um, drawing in part from that EPA uh, data uh, from the uh, from the input side, I'll be kind of showing uh, a few portions of how the um, how that data can be used in uh, economic forecasting, um, as well as afterwards, I'll be uh, highlighting uh, a, a recent analysis of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that was conducted and presented recently. Um, following those, we'll be having a Q&A session. I'll be happy to take your questions at that time, um, but feel free to uh, type in questions throughout the presentation and uh, we'll get to those uh, near the end of the presentation. Uh, so just a brief overview uh, to put things in perspective for the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, obviously, a large part of it is the uh, environmental angle. Um, this is not including uh, different provisions for raising taxation. Uh, it doesn't include uh, prescription drug reform, um, other uh, spending on, on other topics. Uh, a large part of it uh, is estimated to be about 783 billion dollars in total, uh, that being done over a number of years, uh, is devoted to uh, climate initiatives and uh, uh, reforms to energy markets, um, or re reforms to energy in the form of investments in uh, clean and renewable energy. So uh, a good portion of that funding uh, is devoted uh, through the EPA, um, and uh, a portion of that then is uh, specifically for clean air uh, initiatives. Now, um, go through those now. So the categories fall into, or the initiatives fall into three uh, very broad categories that we're going through. The first being environmental justice. Um, <clears throat> so first, the largest part of the parts of these, and on each of these slides, the initiatives. Uh, from uh, larger to smaller initiatives, so just for uh, readability purposes, uh, that works quite well. Uh, first is the greenhouse gas production funds. Um, most of these funds are available to state uh, organizations, uh, tribal organizations, as well as local governments. Um, but uh, where it's outlined here, it will also be available or has been available as well uh, to related organizations. So for greenhouse gas reduction funds, it's also available to nonprofit and green banks. Um, you'll also see a lot of time that these initiatives have um, within their process a prioritization process or um, some form of informational process that uh, looks at factors beyond uh, you know, mere impact. Um, these would include low-income communities and dis historically disadvantaged communities. Um, for example, the uh, $7 billion solar for all grant competition, uh, which falls under the greenhouse gas reduction fund, is in the interest of uh, expanding access to clean green energy through uh, 
uh, solar panels to those communities that have historically not had access uh, to these or had um, the funding available to raise these funds. Um, obviously, we see you know, solar panels uh, all over the place, mostly on uh, you know, more upscale, larger buildings. Uh, so a large part of this interest is to expand access to predominantly more rural areas, uh, as well as uh, lower income areas uh, throughout the country. Uh, separate from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, there are environmental and climate justice uh, grants, um, which is separated into a few different categories, uh, but mostly with uh, pollution monitoring, prevention, and remediation. Um, in large part, this comes from uh, not just monitoring these uh, these greenhouse gas emissions, as well as uh, the air quality, but it has a specific focus on extreme heat and wildfire health and uh, climate risk mitigation. Um, there's also a, a uh, large view towards the indoor air pollution reduction. Um, I'm sure if we've seen in the news, I think it was probably at least a few months ago, there was some uh, somewhat of a hubbub about um, uh, funding the portion towards replacing or uh, in lieu using in lieu of it in new uh, uh, residential buildings, um, replacing gas stoves. Uh, a large part of this view is towards the uh, health of children who are more susceptible uh, to this kind of pollution, um, but obviously anybody can be affected in some way besides uh, different safety risks. Uh, so uh, this is in part what that would fall under. Um, and as well as the Protecting Ch uh, Children Fund, uh, this is mostly to be through uh, schools, but also different related organizations and nonprofits. And again, the eyes towards low income communities um, and kind of mitigating and improving um, the conditions of these uh, different communities. Also on environmental justice uh, is an initiative for clean ports. Uh, so that's towards zero emission port equipment. Um, and as well as uh, climate action plans. I think that's something else to kind of uh, point out that has uh, stood out for me in particular is that um, oftentimes we view uh, these different incentives as purely going towards um, capital investment um, or uh, related matters, you know, material goods. Um, but a lot of this, uh, and as we'll see later on, has to do with uh, strengthening the methodology of both the EPA as well as different state, tribal, local entities. Uh, so creating these action plans, not just for um, perhaps national uh, natural disasters upcoming, uh, but also plans for day-to-day uh, -day operations about how to improve uh, emissions and also to uh, hold one's community accountable uh, for those emissions. Um, also on environmental justice, the Superfund Petroleum Tax, this is $11.7 billion. Uh, this is an expected amount. It's not a, it's necessarily a pivot amount. It's still uh, a little bit under the process. Um, so fairly important to this, this is a reinstated tax that was uh, phased out some time ago. Um, it also adjusts the tax rate for inflation as a cost of living adjustment. Um, and all of these are to fund the EPA Superfund program. Um, if you're not familiar with the EPA Superfund program, it uh, primarily targets um, those sites that see a large amount of um, some form of pollution it could be uh, from industrial applications, it could be from a natural disaster related industrial applications or agricultural runoff, what have you. Um, but if you think of you know, industrial waste and kind of these abandoned factories that sometimes crop up um, and have in, uh, negative impacts on the surrounding communities, and these are what these cleanup sites are, are related to. Um, I'm sure the uh, the uh, railway uh, derailing in uh, rural Pennsylvania, and I think it was also close to Ohio, uh, that would fall under this category. So that's what the Superfund uh, funding would go towards. As I mentioned, uh, the kind of internal mechanisms of different organizations is also being uh, ramped up. So enforcing technology, this is a bit of a uh, ramp down in, in scale, as you'll know from the uh, earlier initiatives. Uh, where I'll just go back quickly, the largest portion is $27 billion. Um, similar to the Protecting Children, where we've ramped that back to $50 million. So, enforcement technology, $25 million. 
um, basically helping the EPA with its own enforcement efforts, uh, its own systems to enforce the laws that were passed, including Clean Water Act, uh, the Clean Air Act, and as well as the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, among others. Um, and then, as we typically think of when it comes to uh, climate policy, uh, we have uh, some funding to replace heavy-duty internal combustion engine vehicles, uh, primarily those that are burning diesel, large industrial vehicles uh, with zero emission uh, electric vehicles, as well as reinforcing zero emission infrastructure um, and workforce development uh, efforts to help uh, utilize and help to bring up uh, those efforts for production. Um, and we are seeing also uh, kind of uh, tangential to this, we're seeing um, you know a great deal of investment in where we're in those regions where we had um, a good amount of uh, industrial activity, particularly car production. We're actually seeing somewhat of a return to um, <clears throat> to manufacturing in the form of electric vehicle production, uh, which I'm sure would be an interesting topic for a future webinar. I hope we'll continue. So after environmental justice, uh, there is basically tackling, tackling climate pollution. Um, so this has more of a, a, a broader kind of view um, when it comes to uh, climate change, uh, a bit uh, less of an emphasis on that climate justice angle, but uh, still has some intersecting points there. Um, so first, the climate pollution reduction grants. Again, these go to state, tribe, and agency uh, organizations, tribal and agency uh, or local organizations uh, for basic greenhouse gas reduction strategies. Um, methane emission reduction program, this one specifically targets both the oil and gas sector, um, not just in enforcement, which obviously uh, has uh, some increases, but also in the form of financial assistance for these organizations in the form of grants, rebates, uh, contracts and loans, as well as more kind of hands-on technical assistance. Um, keeping in mind that methane contributes, I think, somewhere between 27 to 30 times uh, to the greenhouse effect than uh, carbon dioxide does, um, as well as the fact that there's a large amount of methane being released uh, um, in these different um, different uh, oil and gas uh, infrastructure and, and uh, production plants. Um, a lot of this can be avoided uh, through simple methods of, of kind of capping this runoff. Um, so this is in part what this seeks, seeks to target. A side note about methane, it, it does have a bit of a shorter life in the atmosphere. Um, however, you know, the sooner that we uh, kind of tamp down on methane in the, in the uh, atmosphere, then we'll have a sort of quicker abatement of some of these uh, impacts on climate change. And then under these, again, a, a lowering of magnitude, uh, the environmental uh, product declaration assistance. Um, and this is, again, it's a, a different form of assistance for states and tribal nations, as well as uh, non governmental organizations like manufacturers, real estate developers, builders, and others. Um, and this has a great deal to do with uh, construction projects, which you know, we're trying to uh, keep up with um, with our own infrastructure and the operation and maintenance of it. We're trying to produce new uh, manufacturing facilities. Uh, the term near shoring comes to mind. Uh, production of electric vehicles at home as, a, as opposed to importing from abroad, as well as the production of other strategic goods such as microchips. Um, this, this can go a long way towards that. Um, concrete in particular contributes to a very, very large portion of um, of the uh, construction of greenhouse gas emissions, um, just in large part due to the nature of the process, the actual mixing of the ingredients. Um, so this kind of falls under there as well as uh, using alternative uh, methods. Um, if you look up on YouTube, there's actually an interesting video about constructing a, not the tallest skyscraper, skyscraper but a, a shorter skyscraper, uh, largely out of timber um, using new methods. So we definitely recommend that you have that. Um, as well as uh, efforts to label uh, lower carbon construction materials. So just kind of to get the information out there to consumers and to these other entities like developers, builders, what have you, um, as well as a low emission electricity program. Um, this is similar to uh, those uh, climate justice initiatives where we're trying to expand 
uh, access to uh, low emission electricity, um, solar, wind power, as opposed to where in many regions of the country we still have a high reliance on uh, natural gas, which is preferable coal, but natural gas, coal, um, and other forms. In addition to those initiatives, we have uh, permitting and approvals. Uh, so again, the EPA is trying to improve its own uh, internal mechanisms for how it conducts environmental reviews. Um, oftentimes, there is sort of a, a pro-government uh, action and an anti-government action. However, if we're able to make um, government more efficient when it comes to uh, conducting these environmental reviews, uh, uh, permitting operations, then we can actually allow the private sector to uh, become uh, more efficient and for there to be less, uh, less uh, what one, one would often attribute to bureaucracy. Uh, sometimes it's just underfunding. Uh, so the hope is that this will kind of maybe that. Um, this next initiative uh, specifically tar targets hydrofluorocarbons, uh, which are uh, a major part of refrigeration uh, technology, uh, basically what allows Duration to work as it does. Um, so it continues that the efforts uh, to curtail uh, their use, to have alternative uses, um, as well as to reduce uh, the impact of uh, when those items come to the end of their, their uh, useful lifespan. Um, and this is kind of a sampling of other uh, kind of more self explanatory initiatives, methane emissions, monitoring, um, fuel standards program. Um, and so on from there. Um, I'll also be linking to the site where you can kind of get more information about these uh, these programs um, uh, at the end of the, uh, the presentation, and they'll be uh, available in the slides later after the presentation. So, uh, delivering cleaner air. This is kind of more of our focus. Um, Obviously, all of these initiatives are important because wherever you have uh, any form, uh, really any form of uh, combustion, uh, you know, burning greenhouse, uh, or excuse me, burning fossil fuels, you're going to see some deleterious impact on uh, air quality. Uh, but these initiatives have a specific focus on uh, cleaner air and particularly clean air monitoring. Uh, so we see at the top here, this is the largest portion uh, air uh, pollution monitoring. This is a, a combined funding effort from both the American Rescue Plan Act and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so it's a mix of those two programs. Um, so it seeks to improve uh, the quality in terms of ozone, particulate matter, um, and uh, as well as developing new methods for detecting uh, uh, poor air quality in different areas. You also have multi pollutant monitoring, again, going to state, local, and tribal agencies. Mm -hmm. Diesel emissions reductions, um, again, uh, targeting those low income and disadvantaged communities, um, separate from cleaner air, but obviously still related. Uh, um, oh, excuse me. Um, this uh, kind of has more of a um, holistic approach, again, looking at that indoor air. Um, that portion as well. Um, now we have wood heaters and uh, as well as air quality sensors. So kind of a large uh, portion allotted to each of these. So in the initial, in the interest of kind of showing what a uh, analysis using uh, the Remy model could look like, um, I took from the enhanced air quality monitoring competitive grant, uh, which falls under. I believe the air pollution, yeah, the air pollution monitoring that is $17.5 million. Um, I'll be working with a, a Northeast model, uh, which includes states such as Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island. I think omitted from here are Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Um, there might be a sub state region of New York that's not included. Um, but essentially, this is kind of a look into part of our process. Um, we start with the project data. A lot of the time, it's on a state or a um, or on a county level. Um, for example, for a couple of these uh, applicants, I had to look into what part of the country they're in. So, the Red Hook Initiative is in Brooklyn. 
uh, the Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice is in the Bronx, and the other ones are um, more self-explanatory, although soon at Albany, that's obviously in upstate New York, um, so on from there, and basically assigning each of those to a different region that we're working with within the model. Um, from there, we have these different dollar figures about what the amount of funding or proposed amount of funding is. We'll be converting these into uh, policy variables. So just to briefly go over what E3 Plus is, E3 Plus uh, in large part is uh, <clears throat> working with the same tools that PI Plus is. Um, however, it uh, draws a large, large amount of data and information kind of guidelines from the Energy Administration, or excuse me, Energy Information Administration. Uh, this includes the social cost of different uh, uh, different forms of emissions, so uh, carbon dioxide, um, NOx, uh, sulfur dioxide, as well as uh, fine and more uh, uh, different uh, levels of particulate matter. That's I think 10 nanometers and 2.5. Uh, each of those has different. 2.5 is, is a bit more dangerous, so that's oftentimes a target for different agencies. Um, it also allows for different carbon tax scenarios. How would you structure those uh, within the economy? Um, as well as it comes uh, with uh, kind of pre prefabricated um, industry standards for uh, investment in a coal-fired plant versus a solar plant versus natural gas, nuclear, and also uh, offshore versus uh, onshore wind. Um, I guess just as, as an example, it basically uh, customizes the supply chain uh, for each of these um, reach these plants. So for example, offshore wind has a higher emphasis, I believe, on uh, different uh, steel and, and metal components, uh, just based off the fact that it's offshore versus onshore. Um, so each of these has customized uh, uh, supply chain uh, kind of inputs um, for your own purposes, um, as well as there are also energy and fuel cost scenarios uh, for uh, uh, simulated uh, increases or uh, oftentimes, what will happen from this uh, Inflation Reduction Act will be decreases in the cost of electricity, uh, so that option is available. Um, so I will just pop into our E3 Plus model that I've been mentioning really quickly. So if you're familiar with uh, the Remy model, this is our uh, basic user interface. Um, we have the option to do a new regional simulation as well as other forecast types such as a new regional control, basically setting a new uh, baseline for the regional regions that you want to look at. Uh, we also have the option for uh, national simulations and national controls uh, if you have uh, that sort of interest in more of a national level. Um, if we go into the new regional simulation, you'll see we have some options that I will be referencing later on uh, when it comes to uh, analyzing some of this data that we're just starting to get back uh, when it comes to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, just due to the fact that it was passed pretty recently, uh, we don't uh, quite know um, on a number, a number of different reasons. One is just the, um, the actual application as well as there are kind of defined uh, parameters that are uh, purposefully uncapped, and I'll go into that later, but um, these are kind of some methods that you can use. Um, emissions costs is a, is a large part um, that uh, I would like to be using in this analysis. Um, unfortunately, again, uh, I don't have the, uh, the data to kind of link to these uh, different emissions monitoring uh, funding scenarios that I, I outlined earlier, but I'll just kind of show what that uh, could look like briefly. So we have the option to uh, go into each of these. I mentioned there's fine particulate matter at 2.5 nanometers and uh, regular, more coarser uh, particulate matter. Um, if you are in actually the Northeast even, but then also the Midwest uh, like I am, then you know that uh, you know it's best to stay indoors when you have these uh, all the awful impact of these different wildfires that are going on. Um, these have very defined impacts on um, 
on kind of human well-being, overall health, as well as even uh, short-term cognitive impacts. Um, these the social costs, so it's uh, kind of um, uh, expressed in dollars per ton. They're drawing from the EIA numbers that I mentioned earlier. And then we would basically input it as either tons or metric tons, and then define the region. So let's say we would just do all of these regions equally and just see what that look like. Okay, so actually I input these already. So um, but yeah, so if we had data pertaining to how many tons of CO2 or particular matter or what have you uh, that we were trying to curtail, we could then put this in and say, okay, what are, these are going to be the positive impacts of this. Conversely with this, if we're trying to uh, estimate the costs of uh, perhaps long-term uh, exposure to these wildfires that we're seeing more and more of recently uh, in California and more recently Canada, um, then perhaps we would take the average uh, on an annual basis and perhaps it would be increasing or decreasing depending on the actions being taken to avert it or not. Um, we could then try to estimate uh, larger social costs uh, that would be uh, related to these, these uh, issues. And of course, not including um, the more immediate costs of uh, different land and property. Um, but that is just a small part of this uh, kind of integration of the environmental as well as economic impact analysis. So I'm going to go back to um, where I've already input uh, some of the data that I mentioned before. And again, this is just preliminary, uh, you know, again, just based on, on the fact that there uh, isn't a ton of data that we're working with uh, right now um, that's not readily available. Um, it's just kind of a preliminary look on, on how uh, more of an economic impact analysis side could be coupled with that environmental impact um, as well. So I'll go to my inputs list. Um, essentially what I've done is I've I'll try to model the air pollution monitoring programs that I mentioned previously. Um, like I said before as well, I believe I have the, yes, I have Excel file right here. I basically divvied up the, the ones in the Northeast and, and a large portion of them were in other states. California obviously saw a great deal of these, uh, these funding efforts. Um, but because this is just, uh, the model that I'm working with, I specified it to a Northeastern study. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did it like so, based on the number of funding. Um, I somewhat uh, arbitrarily uh, put this into the 2024 year. Now, obviously, this funding is going to be done over the next 10 years. Um, and based on the dynamic impacts of the Rummy model, it, it wouldn't be uh, accurate to just kind of place it in one year. Um, we might require uh, historical data and then to project the impact out from there. Uh, we might require more data on, uh, you know, from these different agencies or from the APA about the, the time frame under which these uh, this money is going to be uh, meted out. Not just that, uh, we've seen obviously with different COVID funding to counties and cities that they're actually sitting on a lot of that money and trying to figure out how to spend it so we wouldn't see uh, a massive increase in funding or any kind of increase in funding necessarily uh, from the get-go. It might be uh, spent out over an extended period of time. Um, that is a good thing in terms of using the Remy model because we'd be able to see those dynamic impacts over time as opposed to um, seeing sort of sharper increase or decreases um, just from more of a static model. So that's a brief look into um, essentially how we might look uh, more into the uh, analysis or the impact of the um, of the Inflation Reduction Act policies or really any other um, climate policy that we might want to look into. Um, but kind of researching for uh, this webinar and kind of opening this discussion, um, I found a really great study that uh, was presented recently in March at the uh, Brookings Papers on Economic Activity Conference. Uh, studies called Economic Implications of the Climate Provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is essentially what we're trying to look at uh, a little more broadly than what we're looking at just for air quality, um, but uh, still a really, really fascinating study. 
Um, this is sort of a, a more brief um, uh, summation of the findings, and this was conducted uh, by John Biskwing at the Electric Power Research Institute, Neil Rotra at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, as well as Catherine Wolfram at the Harvard Kennedy School. She's a visiting uh, professor there. Um, in general, it, it sees a massive increase in uh, renewable power generation. So this is where that's sort of $93 billion, so about $800 billion over 10 years. So it's a 50% increase over the baseline. Um, in terms of the actual impact of this, uh, they're expecting a 6 to 11% decrease, again, compared to the baseline of, of doing nothing. Uh, at, uh, in 2030, 6 to 11% decrease in carbon emissions compared to the, uh, the baseline, which translates to overall 32 to 42% uh, reduction overall. Uh, and this is compared to 2005 levels. We've come down from 2005 levels, um, but it's still oftentimes used as a baseline when it comes to um, carbon emissions. Now, one of the more interesting findings with it is that uh, due to the boost to electricity production, you might actually see um, during uh, certain production times uh, negative wholesale electricity prices, uh, and that's up for up to 20% of hours. This is in large part due to um, uh, solar production, right? We're going to see um, a large amount of production during the day and then far less at night. Um, there are a number of strategies for counteracting this uh, using alternative methods such as uh, uh, geothermal, which is very, very uh, uh, steady in its production, wind production, uh, which is obviously very dependent on weather conditions and climate conditions, um, but also um, not running on the same timeline, the same uh, ebbs and flows as solar is. Um, so complementing that battery production, large scale battery production, this could be a, a, another way to alleviate this. Um, but overall, a reduction in um, electricity prices is going to be a boost for the economy um, overall. There were more modest uh, forecasts, um, but these were not emphasized as, as strongly uh, by, the, uh, by the authors here. Um, so while there'll be long-term, there will be long-term supply benefits, right, where manufacturers are able to produce more at a lower cost, um, there will still be a massive increase in demand in the short term, right? So we'll probably see prices for different components related to the Inflation Reduction Act uh, actually increase in the short term. It could be raw materials, uh, various raw materials. It could be electrical, excuse me, electrical components, um, and so on from there. Um, however, another large takeaway was that the overall um, macroeconomic impact of the Inflation Reduction Act is actually not, not very large. Um, I saw some estimates, and I believe this were from some of the comments. There were some uh, great comments by some of their uh, kind of colleagues also at the uh, conference, including Jason Furman of Harvard University um, and Ken Gellingham of uh, Yale University. Um, they gave some comments, and uh, based on some estimates, including the CBO and different climate models, it would be about uh, you know, very small impact, uh, sorry, fiscally on um, on the overall federal budget, but also macroeconomically fairly small impact. Um, however, uh, the kind of the, not so much the success, but the, the costs of the Inflation Reduction Act are going to be uh, incumbent in large part on uh, larger macroeconomic conditions. So rather than uh, the IRA having a large impact on the macro economy, which it will have a large impact on uh, the energy sector and related sectors and um, kind of the governance of uh, emission standards. Um, the uh, and the meeting out of this funding and, uh, and so on from there will be in large part dependent on future economic conditions. Um, so if we see uh, increases and decreases in inflation in over time, 
Um, we've seen increases in the interest rates over time. Um, so that, that will in part increase and decrease the costs um, of, this, uh, of these initiatives. Uh, in large part, these, uh, these initiatives will be kind of at the mercy of that because uh, a lot of these uh, grants uh, and other programs are uh, uncapped. And what that means is the standard by which they are meted out is instead of it being set to a certain budget, uh, it's set against instead uh, different climate targets. So essentially, there'll be uh, a lot of a lot of funding given out, and, and these initiatives pursued um, basically right up until we're reaching certain climate goals. Um, so in that, in that part, it's it's very good uh, in terms of uh, meeting climate goals, um, but you know we will see some costs uh, for the federal budget. That may actually be a, quite a, a bit larger um, than previous estimates um, estimated. Um, on the right here, you can see that there was actually a comparative analysis as well between the Inflation Reduction Act um, subsidies versus instituting a carbon tax. Um, I believe the assumption was that the carbon tax would uh, meet the same uh, CO2 reduction levels. And then simply comparing the costs here, so you can you can compare um, the different shares in uh, energy generation, um, but also the total abatement cost um, per ton of CO2 reduction. Now, that's it is a bit of a difference between again a very hypothetical uh, uh, scenario. Carbon tax has been something of interest, but it just was not uh, the form of policy as implemented here. Um, and again, these are estimates, but even if we compare the $83 per ton um, estimate of what the cost will be for the IRA, it still outweighs the 185, excuse me, $185 uh, per ton social costs of uh, CO2. Um, so even if the fiscal impacts, even if um, we see fluctuations in the energy market, even if those are a bit more than were expected, uh, it is still a better alternative, it is still cost effective um, at reducing emissions. If we saw, you know, if we're going to go back to the event to cost analysis, if we saw a greater dollar value of uh, the cost to uh, abate these emissions versus the benefits of abating emissions, then I think there would be, there'd be some cause for concern, but at this time, it seems to be uh, right on track to helping to reduce uh, carbon emissions and increase um, uh, quality, uh, air, air quality over the uh, next 10 years or so. So uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I hope this kind of opens up more of a uh, conversation about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and um, its people interested and seen really the intricacies of it. Um, I guess for me personally, I thought the perspective that um, you know, for a long time, I think the, the economy has had some trouble getting data from environmental impacts and, and then kind of converting those, uh, those impacts into dollar values. Um, but at the same level, uh, we have to have our climate policy uh, informed by our, uh, our economic realities. Um, so the kind of the takeaway that in large part the while the effectiveness of this uh, policy seems promising, uh, full cost is going to be in large part dependent on uh, standard economic conditions of interest rates and inflation rate and so on from there. Um, so again, thank you all for attending. Um, and I'll see if we have any questions. Awesome. Thank you, everyone who attended, and thank you, David, for the great presentation. Uh, we'll shortly be getting into the question portion of the presentation. So if you have a question, I encourage you to drop it below. We've already had some come in, so you've got some time to put it in if you have one. Um, in about an hour, an email will be sent out to you that contains the recording from this webinar, as well as the slides. Uh, we encourage you to use these as a reference um, or a, a reference of Remy and the E3 Plus model. If you have any questions about them, uh, please reach out to info at remy.com and we'll assist you in any way we can. So the first question we received is kind of a, uh, an interesting one. Uh, it is, does a decrease in pollution change demand towards the healthcare industry? 
Yeah, we would expect to see that. Um, so um, a lot of the time, um, let me see. So I would, I would look more into the exact mechanism by which we finance social cost of those emissions, but health costs do uh, have a large part of that. Um, now, uh, if you wanted to have a more in-depth analysis about the impacts of uh, alleviated uh, emissions, uh, excuse me, alleviated air quality uh, conditions and, and uh, kind of effective emission standards, uh, then you could certainly uh, model that as a decrease in, in cost for the health industry. You would expect to see that. Um, I believe uh, one of our clients, uh, air quality, excuse me, South Coast Air Quality Management District, uh, the, which uh, deals with uh, Los Angeles County and some of the surrounding counties, um, they have some some really good in-depth analysis of uh, uh, you know some of the um, the impacts of alleviating uh, air quality uh, issues. Um, and of course, over, you know, I think maybe 30 years ago or so, Los Angeles had a great deal of smog and, and related issues. And now Los Angeles is, is a much better place uh, than, it, than it used to be in large part due to uh, the diligence of uh, AQMD. Um, so they probably have a like, large amount of, of uh, literature on that, but yes, in, in, in short, yeah. Well, we, we would hope to be alleviating a great deal of um, healthcare costs as well as just general healthcare issues um, if we saw those increases. Awesome, thank you. The next question we received is, um, what kind of pollution reduction projects has Remy E3 Plus been used to model in the past? Yeah, so, um, I mean, generally, it's gonna be something like a solar power plant. Um, it, a lot of times it's used in combination uh, with other methods, like I mentioned for AQMD, um, they have their own methodologies uh, for, um, for calculating uh, you know, the net benefits and, and uh, uh, that are related to alleviating uh, air quality conditions. Um, when it comes to other projects, you can look at, uh, like mentioned from the previous, uh, uh, the previous question, um, you know, uh, alleviating different costs that are uh, related to uh, those initiatives. Um, but I think we can probably get some some further information about specific uh, sort of sustainability projects uh, that's been used in um, as well. I know one that's been used in that's not particularly related to um, sort of sustainability, but it is related to um, resilience studies. Um, for example, Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development uh, used our study to uh, kind of advocate for um, uh, helping with highway. Uh, um, kind of highway resiliency in, in their state, uh, and they modeled uh, kind of projected costs due to over flooding at the highway level um, versus kind of averting those costs. Um, so that's tangentially available, uh, excuse me, um, uh, related, but um, we can certainly get more information about that uh, to you as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question, this will, will be the last unless somebody's typing in right now, uh, is, is Remy E3 Plus able to project demographic outcomes of environmental uh, projects? Sorry, let me see if I can get the text in front of me for that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Brian, could you read that one again? I might, I might have to follow up with that question again. If it's more, a little bit more specialized, but I'm happy to, uh, to listen to it again. Yeah, it was, uh, is Remy E3 Plus able to project uh, demographic outcomes of environmental projects? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I apologize. I, I, sometimes uh, the question involves uh, referencing a specific model, and I thought I, I heard a specific model being mentioned. Um, but yeah, yeah, so, uh, E3 plus, just like PI plus, uh, just like any other um, product in the kind of Remy suite, um, has demographic information uh, kind of informing the model. Uh, we draw from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis, as well as uh, US Census. 
Um, so census data, um, if we were going to see impacts from environmental analysis, it might have to do with uh, those larger market impacts. Um, so more obviously, if we're constructing a solar plant, we'll see an influx of, of workers um, into, into, the, into the region. Um, you mentioned uh, demographic impacts. Um, we do have a module, uh, if you haven't heard of it before, socioeconomic indicators, um, or SEI, um, and that basically takes the standard uh, REMI outputs and then uh, disaggregates them further um, into more demographic impacts, uh, such as uh, employment and income uh, by, or excuse, excuse me, income by quintile, um, employment by different demographic factors, such as race and gender, um, age as well. Um, so that is also an, an option if you want to use it in combination uh, with other forms of analysis, like the environmental, like the general economic. Um, but yeah, demographic information is a big part of the running model. It's used to inform, um, you know, uh, migration patterns that we call kind of economic migration due to changing market conditions, uh, changing uh, relative price levels and uh, the availability of, uh, of capital stock in the region. Um, these, these all kind of inform uh, general demographic uh, um, changes in different regions. Um, but when it comes to those more specific uh, demographic impacts, uh, like a, a kind of, uh, race or gender or what have you, then SEI is a good tool for that. Um, that. Awesome. Thank you for the, the great responses, David. Uh, so that's all the questions that have come in. So I want to say thank you, David, for the great presentation. And also thank you to all who attended. Um, just a quick reminder that shortly after the webinar concludes in about an hour, we'll be sending out a copy of the slides and the recording of this webinar. Um, please reach us, out to us uh, if you need any help with those or if you have any questions. And uh, again, thank you for joining. We hope you have a, a great day and a great week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.